Hi, everyone, and welcome to our session, The Actuary and Social Justice. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kudachi Banda, and I will be moderating the session today. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. First, I would like to reiterate that the views expressed by the speakers at this event are their own and do not necessarily reflect the positions of the CAS or their employers. The second thing is about polling questions. During this presentation, you will see multiple polling questions throughout. To participate in the poll, please select the button or to the left of the answer that best represents your views or experiences. On the left side of your screen, you will see the text chat window and a question and answer window. All questions that you submit through the Q&A window are only seen by the presenters, and I'll do my best to prioritize the questions as we go, but we may not get to all of them. Please do keep them coming in though during the presentation. You will also be able to comment along with your, with your fellow attendees in the text chat window. However, please make sure that the use of the question and answer windows is for questions for the speakers. I also want to apologize ahead of time for the formatting of the slides. As you know, in this, um, in this world we're living in today, unfortunately, the screen formats of the presentation don't always match the ones that are in the PowerPoint, so please bear with us for that. Okay, so let's jump right in. So this past summer, America, and really the world, went through a period of self-reflection. Race was catapulted into the national conversation in a way that I certainly haven't seen since I've come to this country. And we had a lot of conversations about systemic racism and racial inequality. Many of the conversations we had at the time were focused on looking inward and taking actions as individuals. But now that the summer has turned to autumn, it's really time to talk about that systemic piece. If most of America believes that systemic racism still exists, then does that mean that the insurance industry is part of that racist system? What does that mean and what can we do about it? To help me answer those questions, I have four illustrious speakers with me. We have Mary Frances Miller, Samantha Kyle, Talithia Williams, and Jessica Leon. They are all really illustrious members of our organization. And in fact, reading their bios here would probably take up the whole session. So instead, I encourage you to look them up on LinkedIn. So let's jump right in. Mary Frances, I'll start with you on defining the issue. Many of us here are aware of the concept of unfair discrimination in the insurance industry. But there is now this new concept of disparate impact that's coming up. What is it and how does it differ from unfair discrimination? And also, why should we even care about it? Thanks, Kuda. So for me, this is all pretty new topics. Um, I grew up uh, learning all about unfair discrimination and being sure that uh, everything we did in insurance was very fair. Uh, the U.S. has lots of regulations to prevent disparate treatment. So we have Title VII of the Civil Rights Act that uh, prohibits any kind of discrimination based on a whole list of things, including race, but also religion, national origin, age, and sex. Uh, Title VIII uh, also uh, prohibits discrimination in housing. And uh, the FTC has uh, numerous regulations uh, that... Uh, uh, prevent or, or at least uh, prohibit discrimination in lending practices. So we've made a lot of progress in terms of regulations since the 1960s. On the other hand, it's very easy to just do a little bit of digging in uh, the current media and discover that there's a lot of discussion about unequal results. So my local business journal, uh, certainly one of the more conservative uh, pieces of media that you're going to find. Uh, just recently, in the last month or so, had this lovely uh, article about one system unequal access that uh, despite the fact that the economy's been expanding for 10 years and uh, overall looks pretty good, lending to Black-owned businesses has dropped by 50%. The Wall Street Journal tells us that uh, the pandemic is uh, threatening to widen the racial homeownership gap, that more black Americans 
are losing their homes and uh, finding it harder to get mortgages uh, on a proportional basis than white Americans. The New Yorker tells us uh, that the Harvard case, uh, Harvard tried very hard. They, they tried to achieve racial diversity without coding a race, and they have been uh, abysmally uh, unsuccessful. So let's talk a little bit about some definitions. Uh, we all know about unfair discrimination. That's on our exams. And it goes all the way back to the middle of the 1800s when uh, rich people got uh, lower rates because they had more negotiating power. So the whole idea of not uh, having discrimination that uh, is not tied to your actual exposure to loss goes back a long way. And of course, today, uh, nearly every state requires that rates shall not be inadequate, excessive, or unfairly discriminatory. I think every rate-making and actuary can, uh, can quote that statement in their sleep. And then we have our, our own uh, rate-making principles that says flat out a rate structure is unfairly discriminatory if the premium differences between insureds don't correspond to differences in expected insurance costs. And no insurer today in the United States uh, or Canada rates on, a base, on the basis of race. That's just not a, a rating variable that's used. So let's define disparate impact. The whole concept of disparate impact goes back to the 1970s where Duke Power was using an employment test that even though it didn't use uh, racial status or, or ethnic status as a variable or as, as a criterion, it nevertheless disparately impacted uh, ethnic mi minorities. So the tests that they were using had different results depending upon uh, what your ethnic or racial background was. So disparate impact is when you have indirect and, and probably unintentional discrimination uh, with, despite the fact that uh, on, on paper your tests all look like they're reasonable. So if we think about a Venn diagram, we're great at, at these things. Unfair discrimination, the focus is on, is on the input, so the classification variable in the case of, of uh, property casualty insurance. So an example of unfair discrimination that doesn't have a disparate impact uh, would be if you, if you rated red cars uh, higher uh, than yellow cars, um, without any basis for, uh, for making that de decision it, that uh, you just decided to use that as a rating variable, um, that would be an example of unfair discrimination, but not probably, hopefully not, a disparate impact. Um, on the other side, uh, you can have a disparate impact, but no unfair discrimination. So you, you don't use race as a rating variable but the result still is that certain races get charged more. And of course, the example of, of unfair discrimination and, and disparate impact would be if you use, explicitly use an, an unfair uh, and discriminatory rating variable. So focusing on insurance, we tell ourselves, I learned on the exams, we rely on data. We only use verifiable rating variables, and we stay away from race and ethnicity. In fact, we don't even track it. The data that we've got clearly show a correlation and, and a difference uh, from rating variable to variable. And yet ProPublica did a study that uh, showed that in Illinois, 33 out of 34 companies were charging more than a 10% higher on average for liability premiums in uh, zip codes that were primarily minority as compared to white zip codes. On the hiring front, no recruiter or employer would ever consider uh, applying a disparate treatment to uh, applicants. And yet, blacks and Hispanics are underrepresented in STEM careers in general, and the actuarial profession is at the top or the bottom of that list, depending upon how you, how you rank professions. Uh, so maybe it's time that we started to rethink our assumptions about disparate uh, impact in conjunction with unfair discrimination. 
Huda, I'm going to turn it back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Mary Frances. And so next for our historical context, I'm going to come to you, Tamantha. And in particular, sort of, it seems like from what we've just heard from Mary Frances, the regulation just hasn't been enough, right? We have all these rules and regulations that are supposed to um, support and really prevent any discrimination from happening, but we still see all these disparate impacts happening, um, and a lot of them are happening to black and brown people. Why is this happening? Where did it come from? And what should we be aware of specifically in the insurance industry about our history of regulation and how we treated those black and brown people? Perfect. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Kuda. And thank you, Mary Frances, for a great uh, starting point that really discusses the core of uh, what are we talking about definition-wise. And so disparate impact, uh, maybe it's time to rethink our assumptions. From my perspective, I really think that that is crucial. Um, but my hope here today is to equip this audience with a new lens in order to rethink our assumptions. Um, and that's where I really want to go over the historical context. I think that a lot of items, when viewed in light of history, it then enables us to say, well, are we comfortable with this new information? And if not, then what can be done? Uh, so I'd like to start here with the poll. Um, of the audience, and I know not everyone is working as an actuary per se at an insurance company. So really just thinking broadly about the industry. Um, from what you know about the industry's practices, um, are you confident that they are racially equitable? And so A, strongly agree, all the way down to D, strongly disagree. Um, and really just from what you know right now, your opinions, your exposure about the industry practices, do you feel like they are racially equitable? And so as Kuda mentioned in the beginning, in order to participate in the poll, please select the button next to the um, answer that most uh, represents your view and then hit that submit button at the bottom of the screen. Um, I'll give you guys a little bit of time here. I see things are coming in. I'll give a few more seconds um, and then we'll take a look at, uh, take a look at the results. All right, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Let's see these results. Um, OK, perfect. So from the audience, um, from what we know about the in industry's practices, we're confident that they're racially equitable. Um, so 8% strongly agree. 49% um, somewhat agree. 36% uh, somewhat disagree. And then 5% strongly disagree. Um, and I think this is at the, the core of what we're talking about. From what we know about what we do, how comfortable are we? And there's a lot of uh, folks in that gray area. Some would agree, some would disagree. I think there's a lot of great things that we do. Um, so really interested to see um, after this presentation um, what some of our thoughts are. Um, so let's get started. Kuda um, alluded to um, a lot of what's been going on um, in the society as a whole. And so really in May, protests erupted over police killings and brutality. They spread globally and they continue today. Um, and so the killing of George Floyd brought mainstream attention to an ongoing movement of Black Lives Matter. As of mid-June, 15 to 26 million, these are polling results, so it's a wide confidence interval here, um, but American adults participated in a Black Lives Matter or a police brutality protest and this is a huge record. The previous record was held by the Women's March um, for 4.6 million. Um, and so people are getting engaged, um, hitting the streets to kind of spread uh, their opinion and really fight for what they think change um, should be. Um, and while the recent murders of Black people have drawn unprecedented worldwide attention, they're really the only the most recent events in a long string of Black lives lost too soon. And so here, just going through the list, um, it's definitely not something to be proud of. A lot of names here. And I know George Floyd as, as well, Ahmaud Avery, Breonna Taylor have been our most recent. Everyone has been aware of them. Um, there have been ongoing issues of police brutality, um, but really police brutality is not just the issue here. Um, so it's bigger than police violence. And so policing policies, including brutality has been a focus but recent events have highlighted that issues go beyond policing. 
Uh, Mary Frances kind of talked about uh, healthcare, coronavirus, what communities do those impact? Of the over 200K deaths that we've had, what percentage of those have been minorities? Um, and the struggles of the Black community are not new. And systematic oppression has a long history laying the foundation for the systemic racism that exists today. And so Black Lives Matter was actually founded in 2013. And at that time, the majority of American voters were opposed to Black Lives Matter and most companies would not get involved. So as Kuda mentioned that she's seen a, a really call to action and a speaking out um, that really she hasn't seen since being in this country. And I think that that holds true for most Americans. Today, 76% of Americans now agree that racism and discrimination is a big problem. Um, so my hope is to share just some of the history um, for where we have come as a country, what exactly has um, uh, happened that really lays the foundation for some of these problems that maybe the regulations haven't caught up on, where we can end up in disparate impact and really start to get our juices flowing for where can we step in and how can we get involved. And for folks that did see uh, the IABA presentation, a lot of this content is similar. Uh, so really hoping um, to spark more uh, conversation and exposure. Awesome. So a timeline of oppression and progress. And really, it's a, it's a timeline of both. <laughs> a lot of times we start with oppression, um, especially in the Black community. We've seen some um, glimpse of progress. And then sometimes those uh, same things are counteracted. Um, so back in 1619, uh, this is the start of the slave trade in North America. I say start. Uh, there's definitely, depending on the historical context that you read, um, before that, uh, slaves were present, et cetera, but this is widely viewed as the, the start for North America. Um, so in 1644, Maryland passes its first law banning interracial marriage, um, really solidifying some racial segregation um, in our country. In 1704, uh, this is what uh, in the South, our uh, police, uh, you can say, are tied to their history. So slave patrols were founded in 1704. And slave patrols were the origin of policing in the South. Um, and just thinking how old that institution is. Um, so 1705, passing of Virginia slave codes, um, really this dictated that slaves are property. So now if you were to kill a slave, it's your property. So there really isn't a penalty. Uh, 1735, um, Carl Linnaeus published the first edition of Systema Naturae. Uh, and I apologize for my uh, pronunciation here. Latin is not my um, best language. Um, but this, I think, is actually really important. So the body of work would formalize the binomial species nomenclature we still use today, right? We're homo sapiens. Uh, what a lot of people do not know about Carl Linnaeus is that he also created a human classification system. And vestiges of this are still present. By the 10th edition of his work, which is hierarchical and color-coded system to classify humans and assign traits. And from the beginning of this work, Africanus were always last in his hierarchy and descriptions were always the most physical, detailed, and negative. And I think this is actually important because as I mentioned, vestiges of this are still present today. So we have Americanus, which modern day would say Native Americans. 1758, he said, these people, class of people were red. Um, their physical traits, straight black hair, thick hair, their behavior, unyielding, cheerful, free, manner of clothing um, and form of government. We move on to Europaeus, Europaeus uh, white, muscular, plenty of yellow hair, blue eyes. Their behavior was light, wise, inventor. Um, Asiaticus, um, here sallow, modern day, yellow, um, blackish hair, dark eyes, their behavior, um, stern, uh, haughty, greedy, and then Africanus, uh, skin color black. Uh, part of that temperament was lazy. Uh, their behavior, sly, sluggish, neglectful. Um, manner of clothing, anoints himself with fat, and even their form of government, not so positive, governed by choice. If we look up to Europeus, it's governed by rights. And this in 1758, when we think modern day, like our colors that we associate with people, even some of our traits that we naturally associate. It is interesting how far back this can be traced and how many of our institutions this is really built into the crux of. 
And so moving on forward, 1775, first anti-slavery was formed. 1808, importation of slaves was outlawed. 1840s. Um, so this uh, is uh, really insurance relevant. So the number of slaves insured in the South was about equal to the free whites with life insurance in the North. And so this is uh, um, just a great to talk about slave insurance, which is one of the vestiges of our um, insurance industry. So while many people are only familiar um, with slaves um, uh, working in farming, such as cotton, an occupation for the enslaved um, outside of farming did happen. And so after importation was outlawed, many slave owners rented out slaves to skilled industries such as blacksmithing, carpentry, construction, mining, and steamboat operations for additional income. Fear, there were many occupational hazards that accompanied these skilled jobs and slave owners sought to insure their property, taking out policies on the enslaved to ensure compensation in case of peril. So slave insurance was one of the earliest forms of industrial risk management, providing an important source of revenue for some of today's largest multinational insurance corporations um, and also providing um, some economic liquidity um, back for that time for Southern slave owners. Um, so 1863 to 1865, freedom of the enslaved. We had the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. And then Juneteenth, which uh, I think got a lot of uh, um, uh, attention this year. And many companies have declared it as a holiday, many states as well, still not federally. But 1865, Juneteenth, when the last frees were um, slaved and uh, free, told they were free in Texas. Um, so in 1865 as well, um, Abraham, one month prior to the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, um, he actually signed a bill that established the Freedmen's Bureau. So this was like a first step towards progress um, with a goal to assist the over 4 million newly freed slaves. So they were going to provide food, housing, medical aid, establish schools, offer legal assistance and settling on land. Um, interestingly enough, citing preferential treatment for one group, the newly freed slaves, versus another, um, folks that were already free, and a huge financial federal burden, Andrew Johnson vetoed an extension of this twice. Um, and then Johnson continued to undermine the Bureau in Congress, succumbed to pressure to dismantle this Bureau in 1872. So a lot of the help that it was set out to do didn't uh, actually come to fruition. And then as well, not only did that bill not take the shape and have the impact that it was meant to, but at this same time, a lot of states started passing black codes, which would be the, um, the first uh, Jim Crow laws. Um, so blacks had to have written evidence of employment for the coming year each January. Um, they would have to forfeit wages and risk arrest if they broke their year long contract. It limited the occupations that they were allowed to via taxing others. Um, and at that time, if you already didn't have access to um, jobs and money, uh, it really limited what jobs you could work in. And then it also said that you can buy property, um, but many states limited the type of property. So that home ownership, that land ownership was definitely limited under these. Um, so 1875, the first uh, Civil Rights Act was passed. I know we all are uh, really focused on the, the 1950s and 60s movements. Um, but these were also overturned in 1883, um, 1880s formalizing of police um, and also formal race based insurance pricing. Um, 1889 to the 90s, Mississippi passes their first poll tax. Uh, and this is tied to voter suppression, which still exists in many forms today, um, but also the Actuarial Society of Americas was formed. Um, 1896, Hoffman publishes Race Traits and Tendencies of the American Negro, which justifies racial inferiority. Um, 1898, Louisiana limits voting for blacks via the grandfather clause, um, and other states really followed suit. A 1900 Black National Anthem, Black Wealth is Booming. Here you have uh, now with um, different communities forming, as much as there wasn't integration, you did have communities that formed that were doing very well. You had Black doctors, Black professors, Black teachers living and owning homes in these Black communities. But again, the 1900s to the 1920s, a lot of race massacres broke out. And so with growing economic wealth in Black communities came racial terror from whites, racial massacres, destroying thousands of homes and business, leaving tens of thousands homeless. 
And I really want to highlight that there was no justice served for those killed and no repayment of economic value lost. If you look back during these times for any arrests that were made, actually they arrested black people and not necessarily the ones destroying properties and killing people. Um, and then also, if you're wondering why you didn't learn about this in school, I know for me, I, I didn't um, back in my pre-college days, um, but newspapers removed articles from their archives um, and police and state militia archives went missing as part of a news blackout. And then according to the US uh, Department of Education, starting in 2004, um, we did start teaching this in schools, which is great for the younger generation. I happen to miss that, that part. Um, and so also during that time, 1900 to 1920s, the KKK membership was the highest ever. And I do wanna highlight that at that point, about 5% of the nation was an official member within the KKK, 5% of the nation. Um, also at this time, we had the American Institute of Actuaries formed, um, which was a predecessor to CAS. Um, and so I really wanna highlight these, that there's just a lot of history and context and accepted things that happened when a lot of our organizations were um, coming about as well. So within the 1930s, um, federal mandated exclusion of the Federal Housing Administration um, starting in 1934, explicitly and purposefully excluded Blacks. Um, and so this impacts a lot of what we know as housing. During this time with the wars, there was a huge housing um, crisis. Everyone had issues finding housing, getting available. The private market wasn't stepping up to build houses. And so the government decided to sponsor um, and really encourage um, places to get built. But when they did this, they refused uh, for the housing businesses that they had to insure mortgages for Blacks, subsidized mass production builders with a requirement to not sell to Blacks. FHA required that deeds have restrictive covenants where it can't even be resold to Blacks. And these policies were explicit. It wasn't a happenstance. It wasn't a, our culture. Uh, it was written into the underwriting manuals and these existed for 30 plus years. Um, and the Supreme Up Court upheld this until 1948. Um, but to put this into perspective, 85% of New York subdivisions had restrictive covenants. Um, and New York is a Northern state. We view it typically as very liberal, but I really want to highlight how wide this was that really restricted where can black people live, what type of housing they had access to, and then how they could use the active homeownership to build wealth, gain wealth, and really participate. Um, in uh, society and the economy. Um, so 1944, the GI um, bill passed. Um, and again, it limited access to black veterans. So I know I met a few people, my grandfather was a veteran. He was not able to get a GI bill um, forward to purchase a home. And again, in New York, New Jersey, less than 100 of 67,000 mortgages insured under the GI bill went to blacks. And I'm really highlighting uh, states that we view as conservative um, and such because it, it really only gets, only gets worse. Um, 1946, uh, First President's Committee on Civil Rights was established. 1960s, um, so large insurance companies retired their formal uh, race-based mortality tables. Um, really during this time, they stopped the practice of rating on this for the future, but even for business on the books and correcting some of those policies, it didn't necessarily happen. 64, Civil Rights Act passed. Through 71, we saw more race massacres erupt, over 750 riots across the country, 200 dead, 12,000 injured, 15,000 arson incidents. At this time, the black median income fell by 9% and home values dropped 14 to 20%. And again, this was terror to black communities. Um, I know we think of race riots that are going on today. Um, really, a lot of them are protests that then um, are tied to some more unrest. But at these times, the riots were happening to these black communities um, and to these black people. 68, the Fair Housing Act was passed. In 2000s, um, we had a bunch of newspapers come forward to really say, hey, our reporting was biased and we propagated a worldview rooted in racism, the sickening myth of racial superiority. Um, and this then highlights um, uh, today where folks are stepping up and saying, hey, there's public criticism of zip code based uh, insurance pricing. Um, really thinking back to where the government was restricting people to be and have we really changed um, uh, today? 
And so I really want to wrap up with just highlighting what some of this history can relate to some of our insurance industry practices. So when we think about uh, questioning our assumptions, our underwriting questions and restrictions, um, I was reading an interesting article in Risk and Insurance about the broker industry, and they do ask the question about affordable subsidized housing restrictions um, for placing their property insurance, felony restrictions, and really highlighting here, like looking at the history of police, um, how exactly uh, those uh, functions are distributed, uh, enacted. And I did wanna highlight that in some states today, it is still possible that you can get a felony for releasing helium balloons. Interesting case a couple years ago where this did happen, happened to be a black man. It happened that the only time that they, um, that this law has been enforced, that it has been uh, mainly on minorities. Um, but rating criteria, zip code. Um, and here I really wanna highlight that segregation is not behind us. Um, and some uh, different uh, sources will say that we're more segregated today than when um, it was actually legal to do so. And so here again, if you look at this chart on the right, New York is that purple dot. On the right is completely segregated. On the left, you we don't get to zero, but that would be completely integrated. Um, and if we follow New York through the years, you could actually see that it's moving more towards segregation rather than an expected and really looking at the average of moving more towards integration. And then also home ownership. Again, in 2020, black home ownership rates are lower than in the 1960s. Um, education, profession, and then even our product delivery. And this is something um, I'm a huge fan of uh, just different fintechs that have come up, but really talking about checking accounts. So 7% of American households um, do not have a checking account, but up to 20% of black households do not have a checking account. And so when we have a product that we require these things, just get to thinking, who is this impacting? Um, and then are we comfortable? And what are the options uh, that we can kind of explore to address some of these things? Um, so I really hope that this is insightful. Again, my goal is to equip the audience with a lens, um, a new historical lens to, to relook at our modern day approaches and practices and where government and regulation um, really haven't caught up or corrected for some of these issues that we see, how can we kind of take a step forward? Um, and so with this information, I really wanna close with the poll. Um, and so from what you know about the industry's practices, you are confident that they are racially equitable. And so same poll from the beginning, um, again, answer with your view, uh, uh, click the button to the left of your answer um, and then when you're done, hit the submit button at the end. Um, and again, I really hope that this was really um, useful and informative, shared some new information and really sparks conversations um, and us challenging some of the status quo. And I will give us some time to answer here. Awesome. And um, I will skip forward to our polling results. Um, so from what I know about the industry's practices, we're confident, racially equitable. Um, I think where we started, we had some strongly agree, some would agree. I think now our, our highest is in the somewhat disagree and strongly disagree. And really, again, my, my hope is for us to relook at these things and challenge uh, things. And to Mary Frances' question um, earlier, uh, just let's challenge some of these these assumptions. And so back to you, Kuda. All right, thank you very much, Tamantha. And I will admit that I am an immigrant and didn't grow up in this country. And so I was ignorant to a lot of this history. And as a result of that, I had very long held ideas about the power of statistics and numbers and how we only should believe the numbers and really was ignorant to the context. Um, and so sort of learning about this history was both uncomfortable um, and jarring as well. And, and so one of the things that I wanted to find out was, is it just us? Is it just the insurance industry that's suffering from this sort of sordid history? Um, and so Talitha, I want to bring you in because you're a statistician. And as our sister profession, these same issues, um, are you struggling with the same things? And, and what are you doing about this idea of systemic bias in the statistical profession that we could maybe learn from as actuaries. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Kuda. Um, the statistics community is definitely um, struggling with, with many of the same issues. And, you know, when you look at organizations like the American Statistical Association or the American Mathematical Associations, um, for me, three things come to mind that they are trying to do to sort of combat these issues of how um, as, as Tamantha mentioned, how this, you know, racism, uh, has sort of perpetuated, uh, into what we see today in society. The first thing that, that we're doing is creating what, what I call Jedi committees. Um, these are justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion committees. And often, uh, many societies are sort of creating these committees to be more introspective, to sort of look at ways that their organization uh, was founded, you know, um, some of the policies and procedures that in place and, and how that might disproportionately affect members of the organization or members of the community. So sort of creating these, these equity and diversity committees. Um, the second way is being more externally focused. So, you know, working to be thoughtful about how they might broaden participation within their field. How are we connecting to diverse communities? So, especially in the mathematical community, which has um, underrepresentation among women and people of color, you know, really taking that on as a challenge and how do we address it? How do we fix it? How do we combat this? Um, and the third issue that I want us to spend time on today is really being reflective of the actual work that we do um, as, you know, mathematicians, data scientists, actuaries, and, and that's finding ways to really combat these issues around social justice by challenging algorithmic bias, challenging the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, because often we're not aware of how that work can actually, you know, fight for or fight against uh, systemic racism. So that's where I want to spend some time today. Let me start by first just sort of uh, talking about uh, algorithmic decision making. You know, in, in a way, our society is moving toward this idea of, you know, having algorithms make decisions for us. And that's been, you know, positive in many ways. We're able to handle large volumes of data, you know, Google searches, airline reservations. Um, and in many ways, algorithms can help avoid the kind of biases that we as humans interject into situations. So, for example, parole judges, uh, if you look at, um, they tend to be more lenient after they've had a meal or hiring decisions. There were studies done where if you send out identical resumes and just change the name, often people's biases creep in by looking at someone's name. Um, or the New York stop question and frisk uh, policy that was biased against African-American and Hispanic men. So there are ways that algorithms can help make decisions that human often bring their biases into. Um, but the drawback of that, and, and, you know, many of us will relate to this because, you know, we're, um, you know, tech, you know, tech oriented and, and mathematically oriented and enjoy programming is that it can often be a black box. So it's hard for us to make sense of how the algorithm is working. Um, anytime we develop algorithms, we have to train it to make good decisions. And often that training data, um, is based, you know, has bias within it, hidden biases, hidden value judgments, uh, potential discrimination that's a part of that data set that we're building the algorithm on. Um, we'll see in the next example of where when you have limited ethnicities uh, represented in your data set, like facial mapping becomes an issue, or even things that we interact with on a daily basis. You know, how is Facebook giving you news? How is it feeding news into your, um, you know, in, into your, uh, the, the algorithm that it used to give you news articles or, or genetic testing, you know, genetic testing for people of color um, is often not as specific as genetic testing uh, for Caucasians and people of European descent. And so I want to talk about ways that we are addressing that uh, in our community. Here's an even prominent example. Um, so, you know, a, a definite benefit, if you'll remember uh, recently in, in the 1960s, um, less than 10 percent of of the big five orchestras had women in them. And this was largely due to the fact that, um, you know, that auditions were done face to face and there was, you know, a bias against women and their ability um, as musicians, not based on how they sounded, but based on their gender. And so when we moved away to now doing behind the screen auditions, so where you couldn't see the gender of the person, um, the success rate for women musicians increased by 160%. 
So, you know, a definite benefit of sort of taking the human judgment out um, by judging the individual and instead judging the performance resulted in equity in that situation. But the drawback, as you'll see in this example, is with facial recognition software. So here you see a picture of um, a blurred picture of uh, former President Barack Obama on the left. And the this facial recognition software, uh, you know, characterized him as, as a as a white man. And so the National Institute of Standards and, and, and Technology found that algorithms falsely identify African Americans and Asian Americans 10 to 100 times more than Caucasian faces. And in fact, it also has more difficulty identifying women uh, than men. And so these are ways um, where the, the biases and prejudices creep into the algorithms that are making daily decisions about our life. Now, perhaps um, a prime example of that is, you don't see this slide. Uh -oh. Let's go back. There it is. Awesome. A prime example of this occurred in the healthcare industry. And so I want to spend some time because um, sometimes it's hard to actually see how this might impact us personally or sort of what we can do at each stage to address it. Um, in October of, of 2019, Science published a study that showed how bias shows up in algorithms and some of the dis disparate impact that those algorithms can have. Uh, unknowingly on different communities. And so what happened was there was a software that was used to identify uh, high-risk patients for more complex health needs. And this software had unintentionally but systemically been dis, uh, discriminating against Black, Black people. And the researchers found that the algorithm uh, assigned consistently lower risk scores to Black patients, despite being equally sick as their, as their white counterparts. But hospitals and insurers were already using this algorithm. It had been in place and in practice to over 200 million people. And so often decisions that doctors were making basing on the results of this algorithm were disproportionately affecting Black people and, and communities of color. And so um, what happened was the algorithm would assign you a risk score. And this risk score was based on uh, the total health care cost that was accrued in one year. Okay, that's logical. Um, but the issue was given that your higher health costs are often associated with greater needs, that assumption seems valid, it's reasonable. Race doesn't even come into play. In fact, race wasn't even in the algorithm. But the data showed that healthcare provided to black people on average cost about $1,800 less per year than the care given to a white person with the same number of chronic health problems. And so this algorithm was failing to identify uh, less than half of the number of Black patients who were at risk of complicated medical needs um, as, as white people were. And so, as I mentioned, because the algorithm did not contain race in the data, the developers really assumed that their algorithm was race blind. I mean, there was no intention to disproportionately impact communities of color and race was excluded. So it's like, we're not even basing it on race. But what happened was they failed to account for the embedded prejudice that projected cost uh, as a risk factor actually discriminates uh, against Black people. And so that's just sort of one prime example of how even today we can inadvertently create algorithms that we think are bias-free, that we think address communities equitably and, equal to, and, and equally, um, even when they don't. And so what are ways that we might work against this? I've got a couple of suggestions to sort of leave us with today um, that we might all hopefully try to implement in the work that we do. First is to not ignore potential discrimination. So it's important actually that we not just collect good data, but also good data that includes race and gender because we want those, um, we want those variables in our data set. And then doing regular reports and occasional audits of the algorithms and checking to see how are we uh, ranking or classifying different groups based on race, gender, age, to make sure that our algorithms are, are being fair. And then public disclosure of dis uh, discrimination related data. Often if a company realizes that their algorithm has some bias, there's a tendency to hide that, right? Oh, we don't want people to know that we've been making this mistake. Let's just try to fix it and move on. 
But really one way that we grow is by sort of sharing that, like here's a mistake that we found, here's this mistake that we found in the healthcare industry because it helps to hold us all accountable. Um, another uh, suggestion is to make algorithms discrimination aware. So, you know, how do we set explicit objectives? I want my black and white customers to be rejected at the same rate. And how do we begin to test the algorithms to make them aware of discrimination and to fix them when those things are, are, are unequal. So asking those sort of probing questions to really probe at um, how are we treating groups within our data equally and how does the algorithm do that? And then controlling for and, and timing when you receive information to try to eliminate human bias. So one way, those of you that do Uber or Lyft, um, one way that this is done is notice, you know, if you go and you request an Uber, when is it that you actually see the picture of the driver? Was well, after the ride has been confirmed, right? So, you know, imagine if Uber said, here are possible drivers, click on that are close to you, press one and they'll come for you. Our human bias might say, well, you know, I don't want to ride with the Middle Eastern person. So let me pick someone who looks more like me. Um, so one way to sort of eliminate that human bias is to control when the information comes out. Uh, another way that Airbnb does that, right, is to keep in sort of an experimental mindset. So uh, withholding host pictures from ads or, you know, increasing the automation. So if I'm a host and I've got a house and I've got to determine, you know, do I want to um, let you stay in my house? Uh, they make instant book an option. So if you want to book my house, you can instantly book it. I don't know who you are or what you look like, but you've already, your reservation has gone through. And so my bias can't creep in uh, to discriminate against you based on your race or your gender. And so these are ideas that I hope we can think about um, in our day-to-day -day work of how we might sort of tangibly move the needle when it comes uh, to ways that we can sort of address bias uh, and, and prejudice within the work that we do. Kuda, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. All right, thank you so much, Talithia. And I have to admit, I'm one of those actuaries who always buys into the idea that actuaries are special and that what we do is very different from everybody else. But hearing that example you gave about healthcare and how they didn't use race in, in creating the algorithms was really also kind of jarring because that's exactly the approach that we take in the actuarial profession. And so thinking of that specifically, I want to move then over to, to Jessica. And Jessica, really the question is for the actuary that's sitting here today going, oh my gosh, I had no idea that we had all of this history and that we're susceptible to some of this bias. So what can I do as an individual? What should I be doing in order to um, kind of take action against some of this systemic bias? So Jessica, what can we do? Thank you, Kuda. Yes, what can we do? And look, I'll be talking about what we can do both individually as well as together as the Casualty Actuarial Society. And I'll talk about this along three fronts. Firstly, in education, then about research, and then about leadership. So first off, I do want to ask a question, and I see lots of really good uh, things happening in the chat room about this topic. But I want to ask broadly if you think we should include the topic of race and insurance in basic education, professional education, and or as part of continuing ed requirements. Folks, tell us what you think. Okay, great. And I am seeing, unfortunately, actually, you can't click multiple. <laughs> I know, and some people are putting in the chat that they think all of the above. But I'm seeing a pretty, pretty evenly split out, and I think probably a lot of folks thought all of the above. Look, I, I completely agree with you. I think. Let me give you an update on, on what's been going on in each of these areas. Uh, in the area of basic education, there have been some early stage talks about how we can incorporate this topic within our course on professionalism. That's one. On professional education, I think there is a lot of appetite for sessions like the one we're having today. And then further to that point, uh, I know that there has been a lot of appetite for being able to count a session like today as part of your continuing education requirements, not just within the sort of limit of the three hours that we have towards business topics, 
but perhaps, for example, in a separate category, um, or perhaps in the professionalism arrows that we need. And on that front, I know that the Academy has put out uh, an exposure draft for the continuing education requirements that you need to make statements of actuarial uh, opinion. And that has garnered actually over a hundred letters about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the need to treat that differently uh, as we uh, account for our continuing education requirements. So I think there is a tremendous, um, there is tremendous momentum there on this topic. Okay. So that's on the education front. I now want to move on to research. So for research, I want to talk about this study. I don't know how many of you guys are aware of this study, but I thought it was an interesting one to talk about. Uh, it is a study that the Federal Reserve did, and it was a report for Congress, and they were having a look at credit scoring and its effects on the availability and affordability of credit among a minority groups. And I thought it was an interesting one for us to look at for two reasons. One, because we do use credit scores a lot as we uh, price insurance products. And then two, I thought it was just an interesting uh, way to have a look at what research looks like when it pertains to, when it pertains to race. So if you have a look at the conclusion, which is in the middle of the page here, they concluded that there was no compelling evidence that a particular demographic group experience greater changes to credit availability or affordability due to credit scoring. And I will give you, a, it's, a, it's, it's a big paper, it's a very good read, but I'll give you some examples of analytics that they did to come up with this conclusion. At first, the data set. Now, they had the luxury, being the Federal Reserve, to be able to pull uh, data from TransUnion. So they got very granular credit reports from TransUnion. And they combined that with data about race and ethnicity and sex from the Social Security Administration. Combining these two data assets, they were able to conduct this study. Now, one of the studies they did, and they did this to figure out, you know, are there any characteristics in credit models that could be a proxy for race? So they built a credit scoring model and they use standard industry practices to build that model, and that we'll call the base model. They built another model where they just use the data limited to a single race. So they called this the race neutral model. And when they compared the base model with the race neutral model, they didn't actually see any material changes to the credit scores that they were producing. So they concluded that really there are no real proxies for race within within these credit models. Now, another much more simple study that they did was just to have a look at the average credit rating by various demographic groups. And what they saw was on average, blacks and Hispanics had a lower credit score than non-Hispanic whites and Asians. So something some things to think about there and, and a lot to chew all on when you read this research. So let me ask a question to get you guys chewing on you know, some, of, some of the things I just described. I do wanna ask, you know, from what I described, what are your thoughts on the conclusion from this, from this research study that the Federal Reserve did? Does it look okay? It, it, it doesn't look okay or I just don't know. Okay. Yeah, and I realize I gave you like a few minutes of soundbite on a very uh, complicated topic. And, and as, as people who you wait long enough and a lot of the I don't knows are appearing as you think about it, and I can understand why. So, so just to have a look at how the results are tallying for now. Um, yes, I, I can see, look, that there are a lot of I don't knows or it doesn't look okay, you really wanna find out more. I understand why. Um, I would encourage you to read the report. I think as I was reading it, it does bring a lot of questions to mind about you know, what, 
what is fair and how do you conduct research like this in a really thoughtful manner? Okay, now the next thing I want to talk about, so the third thing, is leadership. And there are several things going on in the industry today that could benefit from some leadership and collaboration with CAS and our members. So one of them is what the NAIC is doing, and they have a race and insurance special committee. And this is something that has a very broad mandate. They want to have a look at the level of diversity and inclusion within the insurance industry. They also want to look at whether current practices exist that um, sort of disadvantage minorities. And then at, by the end of the year, they actually want to make recommendations to the executive committee on both of those points. Now, I also want to bring up the PAID Act. I don't know who has heard about the PAID Act, but it stands for Prohibit Auto Insurance Discrimination Act. And it was brought up, uh, introduced as a bill in September of this year. And it really seeks to make insurance companies use only really driving records to determine auto insurance rates. So it would prohibit using income, education levels, and other factors that are really unrelated to driving ability. So I'll give you two sides to the story on, on this one, which I think are interesting, and have a think about where on the spectrum you lie. So the American uh, Property Casualty Insurance Association, which is an industry group, responded, and this is the quote they gave, instead of benefiting consumers, the legislation could harm consumers by making insurance prices less accurate, less biased, less risk-based, sorry, and less fair. So they're saying it'll make prices less accurate, less risk-based, and less fair. And if you look at the Senator's website, the Senator who is introducing the bill, they say, Insurance companies use so-called income proxies to set automotive insurance rates, despite no evidence that indicates such factors identify risky factors. So those are the two sides of, of the story here. Now, I do want to ask you another poll question to end with. Do you think that we should show leadership and collaborate on these topics as they are going around the insurance industry? Do you think we have a role to play or you think, no, the CS does not have a role to play? Okay. Great, and look, I'm seeing <laughs> an overwhelming response that we absolutely have a, have a role to play here. And, and I would 100% agree with you there. Uh, I think it is somewhere, something where we can lend a lot of um, thoughtful guidance based on our work and our experience. And with that, Kuda, I'm gonna turn it back to you. All right, thank you so much, Jessica. And um, so now we're going to go into question time and there are a lot of questions um, to get through. So I might not be able to get through all of them, but I really do kind of want to spur some discussion on some of the themes that I've been seeing in the questions. Um, so the, the first one I'm gonna to come to is you, Samantha, because um, there's been some questions on the clarification of what equitable means. So what does it mean to be equitable? Oh, great. Sorry. I was like, do I have to, to come off mute? <laughs> um, it's interesting. It is something that uh, I've thought about. And, and really, I think that there's papers on this topic, opinions on the topic. Um, but if you were to just Google, um, what is racial equity? And sorry, I'm doing this myself. I thought that it came up with a, a, a great definition. Um, but equity is synonymous with fairness. It's the state quality or ideal of being just, impartial, and fair. And so when I think of equity, and I think of insurance to relate it to what we're talking about, knowing that modern day, maybe we <laughs> you'd like to think that uh, I could live anywhere I want, right? In reality, it's it's not true. They're settling lawsuits that, that really uh, make that the case. But if historically I have not been able to live anywhere, 
then is it equitable to use zip code as a rating factor, assuming that that zip code had equal access? And so this is the, to me, the, the where his, history meets modern day of knowing that certain things were not equal access, that even today, that generational wealth gap um, really impacts this modern day landscape of is something fair given history is really the question that I, I think fairness. Um, and when I think about how it ties to where we are today in the modern world is, is this actually uh, racially independent? Um, does everyone have that same access? Um, and that's where I think it overlaps with the um, disparate impact that Mary Frances talked about. Um, and I think that is that is like really the point. Um, but really just take a look, Google racial equity, especially with all of the um, our current like social environment. There's some great uh, papers that come up on the topic all on that first page of Google. Um, and so really encourage folks to, to really find out more and see how others are interpreting um, what equity means and really what racial equity uh, could mean. Yeah, so Samantha touched on a concept there of fairness. And I think, um, so Bob Nicholas asked a great question around this, because I think sort of the central idea of fairness here has been coming up a lot. So Mary Frances, I'd love to hear your opinion on what you think equitable means. And also if you can opine on whether or not actuaries are qualified to be able to opine on fairness and insurance pricing um, and, and sort of assessing disparate impact as well. Thanks, Kuda. Uh, you know, because I, this is really a lot of new stuff to me. Um, I've been processing as we go along as well. I, I really liked uh, the suggestion that maybe we need to measure, to, to actually measure the impact of our, uh, of our choices. So uh, actually gathering data on, on race and seeing what the output result is in our rating algorithms is, uh, I think, at least as important as making sure that we don't use race in the algorithm itself. Um, you know, when I think about what's fair, my mother is 91 years old, and she's living in a lovely assisted living uh, apartment. Uh, my sisters and I subsidize uh, that a little bit, but she's still largely uh, relying on money that she and my dad saved. My father passed away in, at 50. So a lot of their savings that they had came from a home that they purchased in the mid-1960s that was paid off by a life insurance policy when my father passed away. The home uh, appreciated in value dramatically, and when she sold it, uh, she uh, ended up with a very nice nest egg. All that goes back to the early 1950s when they were first married and bought their first home on a GI Bill guaranteed mortgage. So today, not only is my mother benefiting from that, I'm benefiting from it because my subsidization of my mother's income is a whole heck of a lot lower than it would be uh, if she didn't have that nice nest egg. And I hadn't really even thought about, about that until we started to prepare this presentation. So I, yes, I think as actuaries, we think about data, but we also think about business. And it's really important that we understand how our decisions affect all kinds of things other than just the immediate rate that's charged or the, the immediate effect or the immediate policy. Thanks, Mary Frances, and, and that's a powerful story um, that I think really drives home that, I, that idea. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so Talithia, I would like to come to you um, because you mentioned earlier that I, I go back to it again because for me, it's, it's just so um, hard hitting. The study that was done where it was race blind, but then the outcome actually showed that there were disparate impacts um, for black and brown people. And, and I, I think I shared this earlier, the actuarial profession really prides itself on not collecting race information. In fact, I think a lot of our um, compliance departments would, would sort of throw a fit if we even suggested that we wanted to do something with race in it. So how do you suggest going about doing an analysis that is race aware, as you called it? Like, how would we collect race data responsibly and use it in our analysis responsibly and also, how can we maybe start to make the, the case for our compliance departments that actually collecting race information 
could be useful in, in an analysis that ends up sort of not having a disparate impact. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's going to be critical going forward that we start to collect sensitive data and we just we have to get to a point where we just get over it. I mean, I um, because the only way that you can see that there's disparate impact is that, you know, that there is the reason that this healthcare care study um, was so prominent is that they 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 put the black box out there. They allowed researchers to come in and critique the model, thinking that it was working successfully. And so, you know, um, and so it was only when these these researchers had access to the full data set that they were able to see the discrepancy. And so, I I think we just have to start pushing our organization for transparency. And maybe it's a test case. Maybe it's not everyone, but maybe there's a subset of training data where you do want to start collecting rates running that through algorithms to make sure that there's not bias that is creeping up. You know, I, I think about, um, you know, what, 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 does, what does sort of e equitability look like? Because often, you know, this is sort of built into our system over generations. And I think about things like sports or like the Olympics, where when the rules are clear and it's a fair system, you know, really anyone who works hard and, you know, is driven can be successful in that model. And so if you look at the Olympics is diverse, it's largely based on talent and ability, um, also access to training, you know, but but once that talent and ability is, is displayed, there's excitement to, to craft that. So that's sort of, in my mind, a model of, you know, how can we look like the Olympics? How can we get talent, train it, and support the interest broadly. And I think when we don't see that in our professions or in our models or in our algorithms, that's when we have to start to question, is there bias that's creeping up that's disproportionately impacting people who could be successful? All right, thank you very much. Um, and Jessica, so coming to you, there are a lot of questions um, in the chat box here around, around the question of education, right? And you talked about needing to educate ourselves. So I'm going to give you double duty. I'm going to give you two questions at the same time. Um, the first is on an individual level, what can we do to educate ourselves more? So what resources can we use to educate ourselves? And then also the second question is from the CAS's perspective, um, what is your opinion? And I, I want to preface and make sure to say that this is your opinion. I know you're the incoming president of the CAS. So I want to make sure that um, I, I put it clearly there that it, this is your opinion. In your opinion, what could the CAS do from an institutional perspective to educate itself? Great question. No, thank, thank you for that. Um, if I think about... So in, in terms of your first question, in terms of education and how, how folks might educate themselves more, I think I already see in the chat people sharing sharing links. And as Tamantha was saying, there is a lot out there where you can educate yourself. And I'm sure we'll be sharing links from this presentation alone. So I would encourage you to read up on all of that. Um, I know that I've also been, look, there's no end of material out there, right? There are, I've been listening to podcasts on the issue uh, and, and reading a lot frankly, to also to prepare for this presentation. Now, in, in terms of what the, the CAS can do, uh, and, you know, I, I listed three areas around education, around research, and around leadership. Uh, I think we are just at the, the tip of the iceberg here. And I know that we have put a working group towards this question of what else we can do as a, as a society. Um, I would like to see us do some research on this topic, as an example. Um, I think there are very real uh, barriers to that around getting the data to do this research, getting people to trust us with data, say, about race and ethnicity. Uh, but yeah, that, that, is, that, is a, that is a topic we will be discussing. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so Mary Frances, I want, I want to come back to you. Um, and there, there are some questions in the chat box here around how do we even include race in our in our rating models? So do we have to ask consumers to provide us their race information? Because that's a little um, iffy. Do we collect it from third party data sources? Like how, how do we even do an analysis that includes race? And you're and you're asking me? <laughs> 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 exactly right yes and and i i, I mean I, I think everybody in, in sort of attending this knows that we don't have the answers either so it's really just an open question about sort of how do we even get over that hump you know 
know, I, I think, uh, and I've been reading the chat box too. Um, we're going to have to, or our employers are, you know, insurance companies are going to have to come up with a compelling argument to their customers for why this information is important to collect and how they're going to convince people that they're really not going to use it to rate, but they're going to use it to measure the equity of the rating is, is a really difficult question. Um, I know, uh, you know, we all filled out the census this summer and when they got down to uh, national origin, I was feeling really contrary and I put down American. You know, I figured <laughs> even, a, even as a white American, it really wasn't any of the federal government's uh, 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 business to know that my ancestors way back had come from Ireland. Okay, <laughs> so the answer is officially like we don't. Know. Does anybody else on the panel have an answer to that question? Maybe I'll come back to you again, Talithia, um, because you have the statistical perspective. Like, how how can we even do this? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to highlight Roosevelt Mosley's comment in the chat. Um, um, I, uh, Roosevelt. Uh, says that this has been done in the mortgage industry to, to address this issue. And so, yeah, Roosevelt, I'm reminded of when we signed for our, when we bought our house, we had to specify our race to make sure that there was sort of equitability in lending. And so hopefully we get to the point where it would become more common practice and people sort of believe that the reason that we're collecting the data is to prevent the bias. We're not there now, but I think I think there's a, a process and a path that that we can get on to sort of put us in that perspective. For now, I would maybe look at historical data. So is there historical data um, maybe that we're not using anymore or, you know, that we could start to classify race and run that historical data through our models and check it that way? Um, and so I, I think we can kind of be creative or even could we simulate data um, based on what we know and then run that simulated data uh, and, and see how we predict based on race and gender. Yeah, you know, ProPublica right. did do their study um, and they looked at uh, race by zip code. I guess that, that that is available from the federal government. And so they looked at the, at the uh, proportions uh, by zip code and then compared the auto rates there. But again, now you're using a proxy for race, zip code. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and so, Tamantha, let me come to you, right? Because sort of you described all of the issues associated with the rating practices um, in insurance now. So in, in your view, from an idealistic point of view, what would an equitable rating plan look like? If you were in charge oh. today, you were put in charge of changing the insurance rating plans, what would you do? Man, so I, I think this is a great question. It, it's something that I have thought about. Um, and I think I have more, um, I think it's been spoken about, like, how do we correct for some things? And that's where, to me, I think uh, there was like that interesting paper, the Center for Economic Justice, that really talked about disparate impact um, at the core, really, and how we can identify these. We're putting race into our models or putting race into our evaluation of if things are fair. Um, but then that next step is, well, how do we correct for something? And to me, once we have this data and we understand when we use this variable, it is biased in this manner, we can then correct for that. Um, so to say, if we're using zip code, that is, in our view, more biased or unbiased. But I, I think that some things I would say maybe we shouldn't um, use. Um, but I think we can correct for our rating variables. But I think really at the core of this and really actuaries bread and butter, we are segmenters. And when we talk about that, like unfair discrimination of rates that are excessive um, or not enough, um, but actuaries get to decide what are these groupings that we're splitting. And so it's been a common pushback of, well, what about anti-selection? Um, and it's interesting when we look back at life insurance and if today you just use race mortality, you will see that black people do have higher mortality rates than whites as a whole overall, but yet we've also decided that we are not comfortable using race um, as a rating variable. And so as an industry deciding where we do think, even if we think that the data when using that singular variable might show us something, for us to decide actually we're not comfortable segmenting on this. And we are then not worried about anti-selection that 
while it might be a variable we could segment risk for, it's actually not comfortable with something, not something we feel comfortable using because of the history behind this. And so really deciding what as a group we should subsidize across or actually segment and charge for. And that's where I think having that common, that common view would definitely be, be huge. Um, but one thing I, I do want to um, point out, like it's kind of wider than rating of this whole, like, well, what can we do as actuaries? And uh, it was mentioned in AIC, this racist insurance group that's being formed. I think that's great. Um, but I do also want to point out that other sectors have really moved to action already. And so just to, um, to pop up, I think the group has like still being able um, to see uh, this slide. Um, but I did want to highlight that the banking sector has moved to action. They're also a regulated industry, um, very highly regulated. Um, but just to highlight, what are some of the things that this sector has done um, that we've seen recently? Um, so Citibank has launched a one billion strategic plan. Addressing racism and closing the racial wealth gap is the most critical challenge we face in creating a fair and inclusive society. And we know that more of the same won't do. A statement from their CEO with a plan with dollars behind it, one billion to be exact. When we look at as well, Bank of America, $1 billion committed to economic opportunity. Their CEO, underlying economic and social disparities that exist have accelerated and intensified during this global pandemic. The events have created a sense of true urgency that has arisen across our nation, particularly in view of the racial injustices we've seen in the communities where we work and live. We all need to do more. Their CEO, Brian um, Monahan. And again, JP Morgan, the most, uh, the largest statement yet, $30 billion to advance racial equity. Systemic racism is a tragic part of America's history. We can do more and do better to break down systems that have propagated racism and widespread economic inequality, especially for black and Latinx people. It's long past time that society addresses racial inequities in a more tangible and meaningful way. And when we look at what are the things that they're tackling behind these billions of dollars that these banks are putting, not from regulation, these banks themselves, increase access to credit, becoming anti-racist organizations, expanding banking access, addressing affordable housing. Um, these are all an increasing black home ownership. And so I really want to say that we're really looking for our regulators to weigh in. But on the banking side, individual companies have not only made statements, but put money behind action and KPIs. And to me, that's the challenge to our industry. I think there's been a lot of statements going on, but we're still in the what can we do? The NEIC is in the is race even an issue? Um, and I would really look to our banking peers where they move beyond the is it an issue? They've landed on yes. And now they're coming up with actions. And I, I think it's fascinating that in the industry, we're still at this point of question of, do we even have an issue? Let's research what that issue is. The research has been done. Um, and so really, I, I think the focus I would love is what is that action? How can we address things in a rating? I'm um, really looking to organizations like CAS, SOA, um, and really everyone to say, let's retake a look at this and really come up with what, what this could be and what this should be. All right, thanks, Tamantha. Um, so Talithia, coming to you, um, there's been a question in the chat, which was very interesting to me because um, I listened to this podcast called Freakonomics Radio, and they, they did a podcast a few months ago about calculating the impact of reparations potentially. Should actuaries and statisticians be involved in calculating reparations? And, and what do you think about that? I mean, um, I do. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, um, 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 it, it was stated well in, in Tamantha's presentation about how the Freedmen's Bureau was sort of started to put a group on, on, on par with the rest of society. And I think had those measures sort of continued and we were able to sort of bring everyone up equally, um, our, our society would look very different today. Um, but I don't think it's just about throwing a lot of money at, at, you know, desperate communities as, as well. I mean, I think it takes statisticians, mathematicians, um, actuaries to sort of think through, you know, what would it look like? I mean, we've, 
we we've given reparations to you know to Jews and you know to to Japanese who you know during Japanese in internment and so there are groups in society who we have you know provided this for and I think it's time that we are thoughtful about what meaningful reparations could do to address some of the bias uh, that we see in society. Um, but again, I think it needs to be a process and, and it's it's hard to throw money at folks who are not used to it or wouldn't know what to do with it. And so I'd wanna be thoughtful about that process and how it could have really long-term impact. Um, uh, just, just like Mary Frances mentioned, right? How it can have generational impact and not just something that someone gets and they're not prepared for and then it's gone you know, a, a year or two from now. And so really being thoughtful about how that could trickle down to generations to come. All right. Thanks, Alethea. And, and speaking of Mary Frances, we have a question here from Joel who says, um, the discussion of social justice has focused on race and rating variables in direct impact on racial inequity. Leaders like MLK and William Baba have also focused on oppression on the poor. Just as skin color is determined by parents, so is an individual's beginning tier of wealth. It seems like credit score is at least as directly related to discrimination on the poor as zip code is to race. Has this been considered as a social justice discussion topic? Oh, well, I think it probably has. Um, you know, if you, if you think about it, it's very expensive to be poor. When you have to buy uh, everything in small amounts because you can't afford ever to make an investment, uh, when, you, when you buy furniture on rent to own, um, every single economic decision that's made by somebody with very low income is more costly than uh, the same kinds of uh, decisions that can be made by people who have disposable wealth. And uh, yes, I, I think that uh, probably our rating systems also indirectly and probably unintentionally discriminate against people who, uh, who are uh, low on the poverty scale. All right. Thanks, Mary Frances. And, and so for my final question, I would like to ask it to all four of you, and I will admit upfront that I don't even know the answer to this question for myself. But what is one thing that you are going to start doing as a result of your additional knowledge on social justice? And what is one thing that you hope other actuaries are going to start doing? So I will start with you, Jessica. Thank you, thank you. I'm definitely going to educate myself more on this topic. There, look, there, there's a lot to, there's a lot to, to think about and I know I've been looking at the, the, the chat room as well. So I'll give you one example for things that we need to think about. You know, if we think about rating variables, I don't think there is a bright line between those variables that, you know, have an element of racism to them and those that don't, right? Even if you take the paid act that's on the table now, limiting it to variables that are just about a driving record, right? We, we, we can probably have a decent assumption that black people might get stopped more by the police than white people, right? thereby impacting their driving record. So where do you draw that line, right? When there is a whole lot of gray, I think that's a very, yeah, it's an, it's an important issue. So definitely for me, I'm going to educate myself more. So right, right. why don't I turn it to um, Mary Francis? Well, <laughs> I also need to educate myself a, a lot more. Um, I work in a, in a kind of niche uh, part of the consulting industry and, and I do basically no rating. So my, my ability to impact what insurance companies do is probably pretty minimal, especially at this point in my career. On the other hand, I'm still the, uh, the senior partner at my firm, and we hire junior actuaries. Not many of them, but if one or two a year. And I happen to live in Nashville, Tennessee, which is home to three different HBCUs. We have never hired anyone from any of those uh, universities. They don't have an actuarial science program. None of the three do, Tennessee State uh, and uh, uh, Fisk are the, the, the principal ones. I am going to commit to 
contacting the math departments and the statistics departments directly at those schools and not just going through their career placement centers because those folks don't really know what they're doing. Uh, we need to reach out and make sure that we're getting resumes from all of the places where we could get them and not just from Vanderbilt University and uh, Middle Tennessee State, which has an actuarial science program. Um, we've just been blind. Um, and I'll admit it, you know, uh, it's, it's not uh, intentional on our part, but we've never had a resume from there. So we've just never really thought about it. And it's kind of embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary Frances. Um, Talithia, what do you think? Wow. So, um, um, Tamantha, your presentation of the history really stuck with me because it was so thorough, and I loved how it connected to the development of um, sort of the actuarial society, CAS, and, and insurance in general. Um, I, I think one goal for me is to think about how. Um, the history of racism relates to math and statistics. And, and in some ways, when I look at the history of, 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 of those disciplines, you know, there was the American Mathematical Association, but from those associations came the Ameri the Association of Women in Math, because women were not a part of the, the, the big one. It came the National Association of Mathematicians, which was for Blacks. And so we have these sort of mathematical organizations that are really rooted in race and gender because there was so much initial exclusion from our large organization. And even though it's sort of become welcoming now, um, there are ways where we haven't really talked about that and we still have these organizations. Um, and so I think it's interesting for me to reflect on that history and you know, they were really birthed out of a struggle and birthed out of not being accepted um, by the larger group. And so that's something that I want to sort of educate myself on and, and educate others on. And then sort of what I want to do personally, um, this relates to Mary Frances's comment about really thinking about how to broaden participation in my discipline. So how can I continue to reach out to young girls of color in particular and get them excited about math and science and statistics and becoming an actuary. And so really kind of partnering with schools in, in the community um, to find pathways to kind of lead them to the profession. All right, thanks very much, Salithia. And so Tamantha, um, finishing off with you, you've already told us sort of what you would like to see done on an individual basis. So if you can focus for me, what you would like other actuaries to be doing um, as a result of their increased knowledge. Awesome. I mean, I think for me, the, the big ask is to share this knowledge. I think it was a lot of folks on the panel and in the chat, et cetera, um, are, oh, like I'm educating yourself and really looking for alternative information that you didn't consume. And it's funny, Mary Frances, you mentioned it. I went to Howard University, um, so HBCU, uh, CP, yay. Um, but just uh, one of those things of like, I am from this group of diverse talent, but also at HBCU, I was exposed to some of this historical context that wasn't taught um, to me in my pre-college education or even at other colleges and universities. And so really my hope is to share this information broadly for us as an industry to find a place for this conversation to happen, um, for the historical context to be shared, to find where should it be put in, where we're equipping our modern day um, actuaries and brilliant minds with the proper historical context for them to know and challenge their own approach and the approaches that have been taught to them. And so really that's my my ask is just consume uh, as much information as you can on topics that you've never considered, find ways to have this conversation and then use that information um, to yourself, reevaluate some of the things that you've never questioned. Um, and and that is really, uh, I think, a, a huge ask, but it's something I would really love um, and look forward to seeing. All right, thank you all so much. Really appreciate the work that you've done. There was a lot of work that went into getting this session together. So really big, big thank you to my panelists. I threw you a lot of curveballs today that you may not have been expecting. So thank you for being good sports about taking that as well. And so to everyone, thank you for attending our session. I hope that you have left today with more questions than answers. Um, and you'll be receiving a survey after this. So please fill that out. And we will now go to the exhibit hall and lounge. So thanks, everyone. Before you go, Kuda, you might want to point out thank that you. if they download the presentation, there's a whole section of appendices with uh, source material that we didn't put up on the screen. 
Yes, that's true. Please also download the, the presentation. It'll have good foundational material for you. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.